Hello, my name is Tian Johnson. I'm the founder and strategist at the African Alliance. And today I'm going to introduce you to an intervention called Ports to Arms, which is one of the ways we at the African Alliance in partnership with McGill University's School of Population and Global Health and the Pandemic and Emergency Readiness Lab with support from the Department of Science and Innovation and the South African Medical Research Council have begun to imagine what demand creation looks like for COVID-19 vaccines, testing and treatment. Part of the goals and the process around this piece of research was to better understand what demand creation looks like in a context where there is an erratic supply of COVID-19 vaccines, but also a legacy of awareness raising around health issues that is consistently undermined by a lack of commodities when, it can't, when communities act upon that information. The desk review was also undertaken to map mainstream definitions and rights-based approaches to demand creation, but also looking at country examples of barriers and enablers to equitable vaccine testing, treatment, distribution, and uptake. The current context really is grounded by gross vaccine inequality between low to middle income countries in Africa and the rest of the world. Africa, of course, represents 540 million of the over 12 billion vaccine doses administered globally. We've seen since the beginning of the pandemic a prioritization of profits by vaccine manufacturers over the health needs of African countries. And of course, high income countries stockpiling first generation vaccines and now having first access to second generation COVID-19 vaccines that are more effective against the latest variants. The current context also inc includes an increased likelihood of emergence and spread of COVID-19 variants due to access and financial barriers to COVID-19 vaccine testing and treatment and the compounded effect of other negative socioeconomic determinants of health. With Africa's first recession in 25 years happening, that further endangers our progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals. We've seen a contraction of global trade, declining economic activity and inequality that mark our landscape. Of course, the informal sector, which makes up to 70% of the economy, was one of the hardest hit at the outset of the pandemic when we saw clampdowns and lockdowns across the continent. But of course, as we begin to understand or continue to understand what demand creation looks like and how demand creation manifests in the complexity of Africa, we need to understand three pillars really. That's supply and distribution, and thirdly, demand creation and how each feeds into each other. From a supply point of view, we've seen huge inequity, especially at the start of the pandemic. We've seen an urgent need for enhanced local research and development and manufacturing capacity. But we've also seen a need and a call for scientific innovation to ensure that vaccines have longer shelf lives, to enable us to build a basis on which to create sustainable and not rushed demand. In terms of distribution, we've seen the first generation COVID-19 vaccine available at source, but communities not coming forward to access this vaccine. And we'll speak about why just in a minute. Of course, this does not only apply to COVID-19, but also other commodities that are all affected by global trade disruption. So within demand creation, we have to ask why it is so crucial to begin to apply consciousness to demand creation, because how are we creating demand in the absence of secured supply? Since the outset of the pandemic, communities have been calling for information and seeking transparency around vaccines, around when vaccines are coming, how many are coming. So at the outset of this pandemic, the response has been grounded in mistrust, in secrecy, in refusal for accountability, and a spectacular lack of transparency in how we've responded to our pandemic. So of course, I'm sharing with you now some academic examples of demand creation, but at the core of demand creation in our review is really situating in this case, a vaccine within the complexity of an individual's life. We liken speaking about vaccines for the public good to a beauty queen's call for world peace. <laughs> what does that practically mean? We believe that vaccines or any other technology or intervention that is crucial to keeping Africans alive and healthy and prosperous has to be positioned in the complexity of our lives. No one leaves a one issue life and it's so important for us to begin to speak about vaccines in that way. How can this vaccine be situated in the context of your daily hustle? Whether you're selling scrap metal, whether you're going to work at the call center, or whether you're working from home, how can a vaccine be positioned as an agent, as a tool for you to continue living the quality of life that you are used to? So when it comes to reimagining what demand creation could look like for Africa, we look at some of the factors that have inhibited demand creation. 
We've seen dumping of vaccines and tests that were close to expiry. This fueled mistrust in vaccines. We've seen hesitancy. Of course, when we speak about vaccine hesitancy, we heard from pharma in the early days of the <coughs> pandemic that Africans did not need vaccines because they were hesitant to vaccines. And of course, apart from being spectacularly ignorant, what that further demonstrates to us is that we are not understanding hesitancy in the historical context. Hesitancy comes from a context of mistrust, mistrust of authorities, mistrust of a public health system across this continent that has consecutively and successfully let communities down at their point of need and have not met them with the services and the quality of services that they need and that they have a right to. So at the core of this is really trust and communities trust in those who claim the title of leader, but also those who are mandated to deliver health, prosperity and dignity to Africans across this continent. So we believe that <clears throat> COVID-19 vaccine demand creation has to be person focused. It has to be community focused. And what that means is strengthening this basket of community health systems. It means working with traditional and religious leaders. It means working with community radio stations. It means working with <clears throat> partners within the school system, within the health system. It means seeing your local chief, your local king, your local member of parliament get vaccinated on TV, on radio. All of these things form <clears throat> the perfect combination to contribute to this environment that we work towards where communities are not only vaccine competent, but also vaccine confident. In terms of country snapshots, we've looked at Malawi, just over 19 million people in that country saw decreased access to media and other information sources in addition to certain myths about the dangers of COVID-19 vaccines in rural communities. We saw religious figures fuel myths and disinformation when new and new variants <clears throat> emerged. We also saw increased concern about the vaccine safety and efficacy, but that was met with enablers for demand creation. We looked at a door-to-door -door vaccination drive in Malawi, the 60-day COVID-19 vaccine express campaign. As part of the basket I spoke about earlier, looking at engaging community radio stations to educate, to raise awareness, to stay connected with the Malawian people, but also looking at government appealing to faith leaders to promote COVID-19 vaccination and those very same members of government being vaccinated publicly to build trust, to build confidence. In South Africa, some of the barriers really focused around mistrust in pharmaceutical companies, national governments. Communities are not islands. Communities see the headlines. They see when there is distrust. They see when there's lack of transparency. They too get concerned when we can't answer basic questions like how much did we pay for our vaccines? Which vaccines? When are they coming? In what part? in what quantities. So the transparency and accountability that activists have been calling for, not only in this pandemic, but in HIV and in TB as well, really, really comes to play in terms of how we build communities' confidence in the system first, before we build their confidence in a standalone product. Mm -hmm. Concerns about the effectiveness in vaccines versus the associated risks continuously came up, fear of adverse reactions and conspiracy theories. But how is that? met it's met with trained community mobilizers going door to door to bring and share facts about the vaccine pop-up vaccination campaigns had some success of course in south africa we led the advanced scientific research we were the first to identify the beta variant in 2020 and omicron in collaboration with botswana in 2021 we secured ip rights for local pr production fill and finish of johnson and johnson of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and of course have the distinct honor of being one of the countries that are home to the WHO's mRNA development hub which is a key step in the decolonization of global health and how Africa begins to build our ability to produce and manufacture tests, medicines and treatments that meet us at our point of need for this pandemic and certainly the next. So in closing, successful demand creation should be context specific and relevant. It should be constantly monitored and updated to adapt to changes in the COVID-19 landscape and the country context. But it also needs to be community centered and driven. Nothing about us without us. But this requires data collection on the ground. We use a community led monitoring approach and ongoing feedback loops, but also development of evidence-based locally led advocacy plans to overcome barriers. And not only that, but also to highlight 
good practices. One of the interventions we use is this partnership with the African Alliance and McGill University, supported by the Medical Research Council and the Department of Science and Innovation called Ports to Arms, where we map supply pathways, we document barriers and enablers, we synthesize and share collated data and evidence with communities to form their own advocacy responses. We collate and present data in different formats. And of course, we publish aggregate data to an online vaccine tracker called Ports to Arms. This intervention is really exciting and soon to roll out in Burundi DRC, South Africa, Malawi, Zambia, and Rwanda. And so we view interventions like Ports to Arms as a key investment to ensure that the mistakes we made with the first generation of vaccines are not repeated in the second generation. Thank you.